Hello, hello, everybody. I am excited, but I say that every time. But <laughs> I have wanted to talk to this queen, this woman right here for so long. Uh, just hit after hit on all the charts. Welcome, Queen Linda Clifford, to the channel. Thank you for being oh, here. Oh, hi. How are you? <laughs> Hi, I can't start this interview off without asking, have you had your coffee today? Of course, darling, you know I had my coffee. <laughs> I just had a cup before I got on here. <laughs> okay, so I just want to talk to you a little bit about your career and like some songs I think are really, really, or were really, really ahead of their time. Um, but, you know, we all for the most part, many of you people associate you with disco, but you're, you come from an R&B and jazz background and all of that. So my question, my first question is, how did you stumble into disco? I think that you probably just used the best description when you said stumbled. I had been working nightclubs in the Chicago area for years and um, during that time, you know, I started in New York because I'm a Brooklyn girl. Uh, and, um, you know, I was singing jazz in clubs and pop and some of everything. And, uh, and then when I got to Chicago, in order to work, you couldn't just go in and sing one type of music. You had to sing a little bit of everything for your audience. Because of the background that I had in New York, I was able to keep working in these clubs with that. And when I signed with Kurtom, you know, that's when uh, the disco thing was blowing up, was getting ready to just <clears throat> We started looking for material for me to record. And one of the secretaries at the record company said, I have an idea for this song. And I'm like, oh Lord, here we go. Everybody got an idea. So she said, she said, um, you know, you should do this song from this musical called Sweet Charity. And I, I started laughing because Sweet Charity was a Broadway musical. It had been turned into a film. It was a movie, which I was in before I left New York. I was actually in the movie and I thought, you can't take a Broadway show tune and turn it into disco. That'd be sacrilegious. You can't do that. You know, they said that girl don't know what she's talking about. And they went ahead and made the track anyway. And when I heard it, I said, oh, my God, that is really hot. <laughs> That's my song. So I literally stumbled into that genre with uh, if my friends could see me now and the, the beauty of it was that the lyric lent itself to so many different lives and so many different lifestyles. People just related to it and grabbed it. They said, oh, that's my jam. No, no, that's my jam. So I was very fortunate to have had that. I'm just curious because also around the time you come along, the songs are getting like very, very extended. So like, mm. were you in the studio when like, would they say, okay, Linda, we're going to give you a 10 minute track or is that <laughs> done after the fact? You know what they would do? They would cut the track down. They would edit it. And I would go in and do my part to what made sense at the time to me, you know, to where the song was maybe four minutes then they'd come back with all the stuff that they had already put on and add that stuff in with the violins. And, and I think that was part of the beauty too of the, the music, they used real musicians. You know, so when you have like a 35, 45 piece orchestra sitting up in the studio doing their thing with the violins and cellos, oh my goodness, what a sound. It just takes over. And speaking of, uh... If our friends could see me now, the album itself, it contains another big hit, Runaway oh, Love. What could that be? <laughs> <laughs> Runaway Love. And something that I, one of the reasons why I really wanted to talk to you about, uh, wanted to talk to you about is I feel like that is one of a few of your tracks that are just ahead of its time. Because, you know, like, 
um, a lot of women, particularly in rap, are like telling like the guys, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to do this. You're not going to do that. But you were doing that back then. So what inspired you to do these, as they were called back then, raps on the tracks or monologues? My ex-husband. <laughs> uh, basically, I, we were, again, we were still looking for more songs to do. And, you know, we had feelers out at different publishing houses, collecting songs and seeing what we liked. And so we're in the studio this one day and my band starts playing this group. So I just stepped up to the mic, you know, fooling around and started talking about my ex-husband. <laughs> Unbeknownst to me, they recorded it while we were doing it. I mean, if we had that full track, you would hear us laughing. We were, I mean, just busting out because everybody knew him, by the way. And <laughs> they knew I was telling the truth. <laughs> so, um, so that's how Runaway Love came to be. It was literally the story of my marriage. Because then my other favorite song, and actually uh, Shirley, Miss Shirley Jones put me on to this, Don't Give It Up. Hello. <laughs> can, okay. you, can you please just talk about why it is important or why you felt it was important for women to hear those kinds of messages? It's like anything else. Too much use of something, you wear it out. Okay? And, you know, when you give something up too easily, it's not worth fighting for. It's not worth having. If you can get it anytime you want it, you've got to work for it. And I wanted young women to understand that they were valuable. <clears throat> Again, you know, from experience, I'm like... I was raised in Catholic school <laughs> and, you know, we didn't do nothing. <laughs> so, you know, it was just a normal thing for me to preach some of the things that I had been taught and, to, you know, to save yourself. And, and uh, you know, you don't, you don't want to look haggard and raggedy and by the time you're 35, all you stuff, girl, respect yourself. Okay. And, and others will respect you. And basically, that's really what I wanted to say. And once again, I mean, that's, we just went in the studio and did it. Because my favorite part is you said, <laughs> I'm talking about some blue chips, honey. I And I don't mean food stamps either. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Because, you know, some of these brothers out here be like, hey, I'm going to take you out for dinner. We're going to McDonald's. Oh, no. <laughs> Okay, we go to churches now. <laughs> yeah, but you gotta have the right chips. And it's not a it's not all about just going to be with somebody that's got money. It's about being with somebody else who respects himself enough to come to you with something. So do you feel like as a you know, I'm a I'm a young man, but uh... Or would you say that women are expected to possibly bring a little or give up a little more uh, when it comes time to be in relationships or things like that? I think that, you know, I've been married now for 45 years. It'll be 45 years in November. <clears throat> Even though the first marriage didn't work out so well, um, I did learn a lot from it. And I think, um, you know, women... We want to be equal partners. And very much so, women are out there. They're bringing home the bacon. They're taking care of the babies, the house. They're doing it all. So, you know, like Aretha said, give me my respect. So, and, and that has to go for the ladies too. When that man is out there doing it, and you know he's bringing everything home to you, you have to respect him too. It's an equal partnership. Okay. Yes. And so just speaking of that, just those songs in general, I feel like personally, you know, for me, when I listen to a lot of your music, it's from that perspective of like authority or like, you know, you are you don't mind telling somebody how you feel or telling them what it is. So is that, um, would you say that's true of your personality? 
Uh, I would say definitely yes. <laughs> I think, that, you know, who's going to speak for you if you don't speak for yourself? And people will not know your needs and your wants if you don't tell them. And when you value yourself, and that comes with time, you have to learn to value yourself and you have to have good reason to value yourself. And I'm not saying you walk around with an attitude, I'm this and that. No, 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 no. That's not what I mean. What I'm saying is you earn your celebrity, you earn the love, you earn your paycheck. Those are things that, you know, we have, all of us have to to work on. Yeah, I, I will come right out and say, uh-uh, I don't like that. I ain't scared. <laughs> <laughs> And something else I'm really curious about is like even one of your songs, such as Bridge Over Troubled Water, is one of, you know, a lot of songs of that that time period were getting adapted to or uh, two or four of the clubs. What is the process of adapting these traditional songs to a different musical genre? I had to make myself very familiar with every note in every song. Um, the lyric, what they meant, and and especially for the arranger to to do the adaptation that he was hearing and and what he was visualizing, as far as the music, and then once the with the two of us would put our heads together and get into the studio, it was kind of easy to to just uh, you know adapt that. I had been singing "Bridge Over Troubled Water" as a ballad for thirty years. And then all of a sudden, it was a disco cut, you know, so, but it worked, it worked. And um, I remember the first time we went to Europe to do that song, there was a club and I cannot for the life of me remember it. They actually built a bridge for me on like from the hanging from the ceiling, going across the club. And I sang the song as I walked the bridge. I don't know if you ever saw the video for it. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I'm actually on the Brooklyn Bridge on that. They shut the bridge down, if you can imagine. Which I'm also interested in and in learning about. I know a lot of people associate music videos with MTV era, so early, mid-80s. But you guys were doing them in the 70s. Was the thought process a little different? Well, you know, I think that a lot of the the record companies, promotional people wanted to... They kept saying that, you know, there's a new thing, there's this video, we got to get a video for every song and we got to do this. But the problem was a lot of the stations or, well, the main station, MTV, they were not playing Black videos. And, um, you know, there were, things were so very different then for African-American artists. I mean, we did not have, aside from not making the money, and aside from not having crossover capabilities, a lot of, you know, the acts uh, were not, you just didn't get the kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, people didn't get to see you like they did the white acts. All the pop acts were on TV all the time and they were, you know, but a lot of the black acts until Soul Train, Dick Clark, what was his name, Alan Freed, that was before your time, way before your time. I know but there's Don Kirchner. Kir Don Kirchner's rock concert. But before that, there were shows that had would have live Black acts come on and perform. And that's the only way we got to be seen. And then, for, because of If My Friends Could See Me Now, because it was so pop, I got an invitation to do the Merv Griffin show. I was like, Okay. So <laughs> I did Merv Griffith's show. He came out, he interviewed me. He was wonderful, very sweet man. Then as I'm leaving, I'm in the airport to fly back to Chicago. I get a page. You can't leave yet. You're going to do the Dinah Shore show. So it just, you know, it was like, I'll talk to my girlfriend, moving on up. <laughs> so it became, uh, you know, all of a sudden, there were brown and black faces being seen, which was great. But now, you know, the girls got all these makeup lines, hair lines, and fingernail lines. We didn't have those opportunities back. 
facts. You know, things are different now. Did you ever do The Tonight Show? I never did The Tonight Show. That was the one show I couldn't get. There was a personal issue with my management record company and somebody on The Tonight Show. And they said they would never. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> have anybody from that company. So Curtis Mayfield never got on there. You know, we just, um, for whatever reason, you know, I never found out what it was. But And just another question about those talk shows. I noticed, like, um, and a, quite a bit of those, like, Soul Train, Dinah, it depends on which Dinah show you're talking about. She had, like, four. But <laughs> at, at a certain point, you know, you American Band stands another. You guys would lip sync. What? Why was that? or a lot of artists would, what, what was the reason for that? The reasoning, uh, <clears throat> the way it was explained to us, because we always went to these shows with our bands and background singers, whatever, prepared to sing live. But depending on where their studio was and how it was set up, you could not get the sound. So singing live was just not an option. That's what changed with Midnight Special and Rock Concert. Those were live. That was like, you better do it now <laughs> because, you know, this lip sync and stuff is not going to happen. But I, I found that out when I did American Bandstand and I asked Dick Clark about it. And that's what he uh, had uh, explained to me. As we're winding down the 70s um, and going into the early 80s, I'm really, as someone who experienced it firsthand, what was that transition like out of disco like for you? I, for a while, it was difficult because, you know, my songs were really at the tail end of the 70s. Then going into the 80s, yeah, in 1980, I worked with Isaac Hayes and he wrote some phenomenal songs for me that kind of kept kept me going. It was like, you know, keeping my name out there and, you know, doing all the right things. But they there was this tragedy that they had, this disco demolition, you know, all put together by a bunch of people who couldn't dance. You know, that's all, you know, that's what I said from the beginning. I'm like, they just pissed off because they can't dance. So it started out not to be as big a thing as it was, but then it just literally, it blew up and, and they destroyed the baseball field. And it, because of that kind of nonsense, there became this war against disco music. And it was primarily done by people who, you know, the kid rock kind of people. And, you know, they wanted their old time rock and roll and that kind of stuff, which is fine. I don't know. Listen, if that's what you like, listen to it ain't nobody making you listen to disco <laughs> you know and quite frankly disco i can remember going to nightclubs in oh god i hate to date myself but i'm gonna like in the 60s <laughs> and that's what that's what they did they played records and people danced and it was motown music it was just motown and people had a blast. That was a disco in the 60s. So, you know, it's been around. And it's still happening. And it's, <laughs> people are like, oh, no, it's club music now. Well, yeah, club. You go to the club and you dance. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, it's the same deal. As long as people can move to it, be happy. Nobody's getting hurt what it's about so then you transition from Curtum into capital and then uh -huh. i'll keep on loving you and you know it's another iconic song going there uh all the man that i need yes so could you just tell us a little bit about how that came to be i would love to because I know a lot of people don't realize that that song was actually written for my husband and I. And uh, when I did uh, Red Light for the movie Fame, 
I met some really incredible writers and we worked together. We had, uh, you know how you can meet somebody and you just click. We had that type of relationship and it was just boom. And we would sit for hours and just talk. And I, you know, spilled my guts and <laughs> told him about, um, you know, my previous marriage and how happy I was now and how my life had changed and, you know, how different things were because of this person who was always there as a friend. And I just, you know, I guess after like two or three days after that conversation, he said, I, I wrote something for you. I want you to take a look at the lyric and see if you like it. And he brought it to me, and that was all the man that I need. Well, some of the geniuses over at Capitol Records, they said, oh, that's too white. <laughs> yes. Really? Yes. We had a... <laughs> yes. Wow. Said, it's too pop. We don't want, you know, we want more R&B. That's not... I said, uh, I, I don't understand what, you know, this is an album full of great tunes. And um, yeah, there was some stuff that was crossover, but it was still r and I mean, the song itself, you know, was, was just great. And so they didn't want to release it. And I fought tooth and nail just to get it on the album. And so the next thing I knew, I'm driving, driving in the car, radio on, here come Whitney. <laughs> I'm like, girl, what you doing? Sing him a song. <laughs> so you didn't know. Like, no. Wh Whitney didn't call you and say, hey, Linda, I'm, I'm about to do your song. <laughs> no, uh -uh. <laughs> no, she did not. <laughs> but she did the hell out of it. Like, she did everything. She sang it to death. And, um, you know, I was happy for her to have it. But, with man. So so you heard the, the Luther version as well. Of course, yes. <laughs> and Luther, by the way, was one of the background singers on my album for that song. So obviously he took a liking to it as well. You know, he was like, oh, that's a good song. <laughs> so yeah. Okay, so and then... I think did it as well yeah they did it i think a year after you released it okay mm -hmm. yeah so it's been around been around for a while did they call you uh no <laughs> <laughs> these young children today i don't know <laughs> no child they ain't called me okay <laughs> So basic. Okay, so after I'll keep on loving you, we get two more records sneaking out. I see the I see the picture in the back right there, sneaking oh. out. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, my heart's on fire. <laughs> and what what happened? That those albums came out, of course, early eighties, and uh, again, really good songs on there. I, you know, promotional problems, problems with the company itself, or, um, and I had excellent writers, everything. And I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> so, but, you know, again, for women in the, in the industry, it's a little bit more difficult, especially if you have a family, you know, they wanted, uh, they wanted to have parties and this and that and introduce you. I got a three month old baby at home. I ain't going to no party. Okay. <laughs> So <laughs> there's a limit to how many parties I can make. And, um, you know, so I, and as well to support ourselves, I was doing jingles. I was in the studio in the morning, driving downtown, doing jingles for Michelob and uh, Tropicana orange juice and everything else, you know, to make sure that the cash flow <laughs> continues. You know, because when you're raising children, they're expensive little dogs. They gotta have stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, and I didn't want their life to change because my life had changed. Do you know what I mean? Um, and it's not that they were so spoiled that they had everything because that's just not, that's not real. And I wanted, my husband and I wanted to raise two 
human beings that we could be proud of. And we did. We managed to do that. We might have messed up everything else, but we, <laughs> we did that. So, um, you know, and I'm very happy about where they are as adults in their lives. You know, uh, my son's an archaeologist and my daughter's in law's third year law student and they're happy and healthy. I'm so grateful. So it's a good thing. So would you say like back then that I was talking to Martha Walsh last year and uh just her, even Whitney, I think the Jones girls, I know Phyllis Hyman, a lot of y'all, you guys were talking about singing jingles. Even Denise Williams was talking about that. So was that like an actual market? Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's a huge market. And um, I think a lot of young people don't even realize that a lot of the stuff that they hear on TV are from some of the old school was old school music from back in the day. When you live at that time, thank goodness, the, the hub for a lot of jingles was Chicago. So the timing was great for me. And I would literally get up in the morning, put the kids on the bus, drive downtown, <laughs> go do a jingle at this studio, go to this studio, this one, drive back home, be there to meet the bus when the kids got off. So, you know, it was like, I had to do that because to me it was family first. And I think that um, a lot of the record companies, you know, that's the thing, they don't want to work with women because women have kids, dirty little kids, you know, but somebody got to have them, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you prioritize, I think that way, instead of, <clears throat> you know, prioritizing your recording career. Maybe that's why, you know, some of the companies were like, well, we're not going to push it that hard because she's going to be home with her kids. In spite of the fact that they were incredibly good recordings. You know what I mean? But uh, there were so many things in this business that are so horrific um, as far as the money and the, the, the way the laws were written at the time they were allowed to basically steal from the artists. Even when you caught them, <laughs> you know, you'd be like, dude, you charged me for the same thing six times. <laughs> Get this off my, my sheet. And even when you catch them, if you don't have the kind of money that it takes to fight them in court, you go nowhere. You don't get anything except more in debt. And um, I decided a long time ago, as much as I would, I would love to have some of the money they stole from me. But I love having my peace of mind more. Is that why, like, a lot of the girls are still having to work today? I think many of the, the women who are out today are doing it. I know I'm doing it because I love it. And I missed a lot of time in between and I thought wow if people want to come out and see the show I want to you know because I would love just being on stage rather than if I didn't have to go into the studio I'd be fine just let me get out there and, and you know be with my people so <laughs> that's that's my thing I love that um and I think many of us are in the same same boat it's like you know, they took this away from us so many years ago. We could have been doing this in 85, 86, but now we got to do it here. I think, well, I think it's helpful financially. You know, kids, you know, when we die, they might get a little something. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, so, you know, you want to, you want to give uh, what you can and do what you can for your children. You want to be able to give to those who are less fortunate, people who didn't have the opportunity to do what I did. So that that's always great for me. And I think uh, some of the other girls feel the same way. And we do it for fun. We love being around each other. We have a great time. We just laugh and carry on. 
And just one more question about the contract. So I, something else I noticed about like your generation of singers compared to like later generations of artists that came into the industry. How uh -huh. were you guys able to get like contracts for like four, five, six, seven, eight albums? Well, for myself, I'm not sure about the other ladies, but I actually went in and my deal was for one one album. But because they had success with that album, they were like, well, wait a minute. Maybe we need to, you know, sign up for another one. And then they signed me for three more. And then they signed me for three more. I mean, it just kept going because each album always had at least two or three successful songs on it. It wasn't just a one hit type thing. And people would actually play the entire album. You know how you can go buy a CD and you say, oh, well, I would need that song. You could buy one song now, but you couldn't do that then. Uh, they would actually play the whole album. And I think um, because people had to really sing, there was no auto tune and no, you know, whatever they're doing now. <laughs> so, so when you went into that studio, you had to be able to produce something that was right. And uh, when they found something and then when they put Curtis and I together to do the duet album, that was successful. I mean, it, there were nine albums. So they don't sign you for that if they're not making any money. So my last question is, um, so you, you're talking about girls just want to have fun. And last year in July, I saw you with the girls. You actually, I said, where's Linda? And she came from the back of Joe's pub, walked by me to the stage. Oh, no. <laughs> and uh, and y'all saying, you, Martha, and Norma sang down. And everybody was up and dancing. So what is Miss Linda up to today? Well, let me just tell you, I am having so much fun with these ladies that it's hard for me sometimes to break away and do something on my own because I want to be with them because we just have so much fun. But <clears throat> in spite of that, I'm I'm still actually getting calls to go out uh, to perform, to do my own show with some of those great songs that you mentioned. So I try to keep up. And then, of course... <laughs> I'm working with Martha and Norma Jean, and we're going to be in Vegas uh, September 13th. And uh, at the Smith Center, that's it, at Myron's. So, um, you know, we're keeping busy. I mean, it, Listen, I'm not 30 years old anymore. <laughs> so the kids are gone. Everybody's out of the house. It's like, you want to go? Go. So... So that's really it. It's like, and I'm taking it easy. I'm doing it in my own stride. You know, it's not a tour where you're just killing yourself to get from one place to another, which, you know, those days happen too. And uh, we're very difficult sometimes, but that's part of the business. That's the life. So I'm loving it. And I loved speaking with you. Thank Aww. you so, so much, Miss Linda. I, I learned you, so Lily. much and I can't wait to make this into something beautiful and present it to everybody. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I just loved it. No problem. And uh, I'll be in touch and thank you okay. so much. Bye -bye. Okay. Bye.